And this story speaks about one's intuitiveness, one's intuitive attractiveness to the powers of spirit. And by intuitive attractions to spirit, I mean that natural, inborn, untaught instinct that informs our choices. Kind of like geese flying back home here after the winter away. It's, it's an intuitive, untaught attraction to truth that we all, I think, can, can relate to at some level. John explains this intuitive attractiveness to spirit by telling a story about how some sheep instinctively respond only to the familiar voice well-known and just the shepherd. And the story explains that the movement of the sheep from field to field is managed by the trusted shepherd walking ahead, drawing the sheep behind him as if they were on a rope. This uh, story of Jesus as the good shepherd is a metaphor and it's emphasizing the magnetism of spirit that holds and protects the connection between God and ourselves. The image of Jesus as the Good Shepherd is, throughout history, one of the most acclaimed images of the Christian faith. And if you look directly behind me at the center window in the back, you will see one of those very images. And they are symbols that identify and appreciate the grace of as it draws us forth in our life. And as the picture behind me depicts, the grace of God that holds it, that nurtures it. Now in the story this morning, we get a second metaphor, a bit confusing. Not only does John portray Jesus as the Good Shepherd, a very familiar one, that we know of, but we also <coughs> see Jesus calling himself the keeper of the gate. It is a bit confusing, as I said, but there is a reference <coughs> to the protective work of spirit, a work that keeps the bonds between God and ourselves alive and well. Now, we may not always be feeling connected to God, but God is always there with us. And in some other ways also, John may be addressing some critical issues in his day about a true spiritual leadership. The kind of leadership that wants the best for its people and keeps out all which isn't good for them. As opposed to, for example, uh, the work of the Sadducees and Pharisees of the day who were so much into protecting themselves and the institution that the people were secondary to what was built to keep the people protected. In other words, the fencing became more important than the sheep that were within it. The metaphor of Jesus as the gate through which the shepherd leads the sheep emphasizes, as I said, the protective nature of spirit. And by this I am referencing how the spirit, the connection to God is powerful, unbreakable. And the symbolism speaks to the contract that God has with us as our creator. I will never leave you. I will always be there. You may not see me, you may not feel me. But I will never leave you. I will always be there. Because of this, all is well and all will be well. So this morning's gospel holds up two metaphors, two images of Jesus. Jesus the Good Shepherd and Jesus the Gatekeeper. These images speak of a life in the Spirit as a grace that bonds us to God, who nurtures us, who sustains us, 
as a good and a healthy parent naturally nurtures, nurtures and sustains the child. Just as that child intuitively connects to his or her parent, we intuitively connect to the power of spirit that surrounds us. And it is good that we speak of such things on Mother's Day. Theologically speaking, God is our mother, the great virtue. God is also our protector. For whom we are given life, and that life is external, but that life is also internal, and we know through promises that that life is also eternally present. And not just physically. And so this morning we are called to pray for all mothers uh, in their roles as parents. That they are able to solicit the very best in the children. Entrusted to them. Like eight who are interested in the sheep, in the fence, as opposed to the fence around the sheep. And we pray that they are able, through spirit, to nurture our very best. As we grow into an appreciation that we are spiritual beings in the body, living under human conditions. We pray that God blesses us in this journey. And we give thanks to God for mothering as we have experienced all of its best. May God bless our mothers as we follow uh, their good example and become ourselves nurturers and sustainers. Co creators. Of the universe. Entrusted to give birth to a church, to cultivate a church that is inclusive and life affirming and alive and speaks to the greatness that is in each and every child. You mean. How many people here, his mother is passed away? I'd like for us all just to uh, take a few moments and uh, bow our heads and uh, offer our memories. First rule of public speaking, make sure your name is the right side up. <coughs> when she asked me to do a wee reflection on Mother's Day, I was somewhat 
at a loss to know what to say. Uh, no one really knows me. You can imagine me speechless. But so much embarrassingly sentimental and downright soppy stuff is said about Mother's Day. That in stage problems, it's hard to follow, so I won't. I remember holding my first born a son, in my arms and thinking, shoot, now I'm a mother forever. What did I really know about being a mother? My own start in life had been nine months in a Salvation Army orphanage. There were no books on parenting other than Dr. Spock, who seemed to change his mind in order to sell an expedition. In a generation that was brought up with June fever as the ideal, always neatly groomed, always baking little treats, always knowing exactly what to say to soothe the little darlings, when to involve their father, and all this while keeping the house, the home, in showcase condition and a smile on her husband's face. I felt like a complete duck. And then, my family and I were returning from a three-year posting in Europe. We were out over the Atlantic in a plane. I had a baby of four months and what we used to call a carry cot. And two preschool sons sitting with me. The emergency lights went on, on the plane, and we began to lose altitude as we went into a turn. Leaning out of the window, all I could see was water in any direction. The voice of the captain came over the address system. We're going to make an emergency landing, secure all seat belts, and follow all further instructions. All sorts of scenarios went through my mind. Would the baby's carry pot float? Um, could I support two older boys long enough in the water to get them to a raft? Where the hell was the life vest? All this time, the plane kept descending, lower and lower. And still, all I could see out the window was water. And what of my husband, who being an old social, couldn't swim? I knew I may have to say one, and possibly two children, but probably not all three. No, I guess you pray. I probably should have perhaps. But what seemed important to me at the time was to hug the wee lad on my lap, put my arm around the lad sitting next to me, and my love for them. We landed quite safely at Kepler, Iceland, on a long way that ran out about a mile into the ocean. The point of the story is that ultimately, when disaster threatens, all a mother has in a situation over which she has no control can be his her children love. Beyond that day, I have many memories of my children, eventually all of them. Good, bad, and indifferent. If we hadn't had mothers to dress us in our Sunday best and take us off to church, few of us would still be sitting in these pews today. I sat in the choir while my youngest child was too young to go to the nursery. I took the carry pot into the bar lot before church and seated the other five in the third row from the front. In a specific order, they poked each other if the wrong two were sitting next to each other. When it came time for me to process in with the choir, I had the baby on one arm, the choir was up on the other, and we just wandered in. Not all of them still go to church. 
But their mothers take their children to church from the Sunday school. And back to the children sitting in the third row from the front. Do you any of you have any idea how difficult it is to sing all things bright and beautiful? With a joyous smile on your face, at the same time, the Larry and an eight-year-old who was taking his sister in the third row. <laughs> so for me, Mother's Day is a day to remember the time of a mother. But I'm not perfect, nor are my children. But we still love and respect each other. It's my day to celebrate. Then, Happy Mother's Day. Mm -hmm.